I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello Horror Hounds, welcome to my Horror House and welcome to our first Monster Monday. Every Monday we're going to be looking at a Godzilla film. We're going to do them in order, so starting naturally with the daddy of them all, the one that started it all off, 1954's Godzilla, also known as Gojira. To keep things nice and focused, each film I'm going to be looking at the same four categories and I guess the best way to introduce the categories is just to crack on. <laughs> Japanese freighter Aikomaru is destroyed near Odo Island and every other ship sent to investigate meets the same fate. A handful of survivors talk of a monster. It becomes clear that underwater hydrogen bomb testing has disturbed an ancient creature, Godzilla. While Godzilla rampages unchecked, the key to its possible defeat lies in the uneasy love triangle between Professor Yamame's daughter, Emiko, Ogata, the man she wants to marry, and the man her father intends her to marry, family friend, Dr. Serizawa. The army and government wants to kill Godzilla, but Professor Yamane mournfully wants Godzilla to be studied. Don't let talk of love triangles fool you. The human story in the shadow of Godzilla is strong and provides the beating ethical heart of a film which pivots upon a moral quandary. Is it right to make the existence of a new and destructive power known in order to defeat this current threat when the likelihood is that that power will be weaponized and lead to greater destruction in the future? For the first time out, Godzilla is the sole monster in this movie, but trust me, that is all you need. Like in Jaws, we don't see the creature during the initial attack or even when he makes landfall during a typhoon. When he first appears from behind a hill, it's, it's clearly a puppet, but the ominous drum and that fantastic Godzilla roar, plus the panic amongst the people really sells his first appearance. Sure, he's a puppet or a man in a suit in later scenes. But the way he's shot turns him into a titan. We're always looking up at him and through things. He's behind buildings to give him that sense of scale. And often with terrorized people fleeing and running around tiny in the foreground. Once Godzilla reaches Tokyo, the levels of destruction are everything you could possibly want from a Godzilla film. The army builds a coastal defense, a huge electrified fence that Godzilla walks into and then eventually melts the pylons with his atomic breath. Then they lay on loads and loads of artillery, the air force bombarding with air-to-air -air missiles. Godzilla lays waste to Tokyo with his atomic breath moving through the burning models. Tanks roll in but are useless, buildings are trampled and the city is reduced to a sea of flames. The film doesn't shy away from the human cost of this destruction either. Women and children are not spared. The next day, makeshift hospitals overflow with the injured. This is a film which clearly draws its inspiration from real world events. For a contemporary Japanese audience, the destruction of the Aiko Maru at the start of the story would have been a clear reference to an incident which occurred the same year as the film was released, only a few months earlier. A series of undeclared H-bomb tests conducted by the US military at the Bikini Atoll in March of 1954 caused Japanese fishing boat Lucky Dragon No. 5 to be showered with radioactive fallout. Likewise, Godzilla himself and the destruction he wreaks are a clear analogy for the H-bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and his destruction of Tokyo is visually analogous to the US Air Force firebombing of Tokyo. The citizens in the film have to use the World War II shelters again and wartime air raid sirens are now used to signal the approach of Godzilla. These events are happening in the recognizable current day real world of the Japanese audience. Amongst all the 
giant monster destruction. Gojira is a somber, meditative and moralistic affair. Very soon we'll get to, in the next film in fact, we'll get to the Versus films. The lighter tones, outright goofiness and the rehabilitation of Godzilla will come later on. But these are deep, deep roots set by this film from which all else in this decades old franchise springs. The original uncut version of 1954's Godzilla is a much better film than the butchered, ridiculously dubbed US version featuring Raymond Burr. Some have likened the US re-edit, re-filming to cultural vandalism and yet most Westerners would have been introduced to Godzilla through this US film version. Without that exposure, would Godzilla have been as popular or lived as long as he has? The original Japanese version of Godzilla wasn't released in the US until 2004. Until then, maybe those charges would have been easier to stick. But now with both versions freely available, we can at least make up our own mind and pick and choose to see which we want. I think the Japanese version is far, far superior. But I have no issue with someone wanting to, to relive their childhood and stick on the Raymond Burr version that they know from when they were young that got them into Godzilla in the first place. Modern viewers and younger Godzilla fans may find the film slow and ponderous. They may see the man in a suit monster as faintly ridiculous. But for fans of cinema, Godzilla is essential viewing. And for older fans of Godzilla, you really have to see how it all started.